Good afternoon, folks. I can see people are joining, have just started the webinar. We're going to give people just a moment or two to, to join us. Um, it can, all of that can sort of take a while. And we will be finishing at 3.15. And while you're joining, the kind of loose agenda is to think about what a learning culture means for you and also what's your action learning experience. And on this webinar, we're using Zoom. So for anyone who can see their chat function, it would be really useful to see what you can to let us know what you could see. So if you don't mind typing me a message just to say I'm here or chat works or whatever, that would be really useful. Oh, yes, I've got one, one or two people are letting me know that they're here. So that's great. Thank you. And the chat function is usually in the bottom of your screen. Sometimes you have to scroll down. Great. Thank you, Owen. And I'm not sure how to say it, Mirav. Thank you. Lovely. And you can see the visual. Good. The visual is that for anyone, in case you're wondering what the visual is, it's simply our front sheet action learning to develop a learning culture. OK, great. Looks like this is working. Um, the exact time, just we're only one minute over uh, 2.30, so I'll give it just another moment or two for people to join. And then, so as you know what I'm doing, I'll be talking through a short presentation about what action learning is. And uh, yeah, we'll be touching base on, on a learning culture. Um, you could, you could, we could spend, spend hours or days on a learning culture, so I'm just going to have a kind of briefest of glimpse. We'll look at how action learning fits in there. And primarily, uh, albeit a webinar can be slightly one way, I would really like to hear your questions and challenges. Some people have been good enough to post questions in advance. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if everybody who posted the question is here. So, but I'd be really happy to get your questions and to take them, uh, certainly at the end, but even throughout if I'm not being clear. Uh, so we'll just give people another moment, but that's our agenda to look at a learning culture briefly, how action learning sits in that, and then particularly to answer your questions and your challenges and so on. And if there's anything that this webinar sparks for you, where you'd really like to you know, have a follow up conversation with me or one of my colleagues, uh, the last slide I think it is, you know, gives you my email address. So feel free to be in touch and we can, we can arrange a time to speak. So I think we're two or three minutes in, so maybe we'll get started. So I just want to get you all to take a moment to think about how you want to be present in this session. It's, it's a different way of working with a webinar. You're kind of very much in receive mode at the moment. So how can you get the most out of this 40, 45 minutes and what's your learning objective for the day? Now, what would make you feel at 3.15? I'm really glad I took that time out. And if there's anything that comes to you and you want to let me know in the chat function, that'd be really helpful. So, yeah, what would be good for anyone today? You know, whether it's a ref you know, have a reflection or just to let me know. OK, so I'm going to talk now about learning culture in organisations. Um, and one of the things that's oh, OK, thank you, Kelly. You'd like to understand what action learning is. So we'll get to that shortly. And that's sort of within the place of, of what um, what a learning culture is. What we're finding is that organisations are increasingly results driven. Um, certainly in the charity, the not-for-profit sector, you know, key performance indicators and so on, and outcomes and outputs are really, re thank you, oh, thank you for that, Owen. Um, I'll come back to that. It's a really good question, actually, really good question. Uh, how does action learning manifest itself in a wider organisation? Okay. So just staying with the learning culture for a few moments, um, 
What we find is that very mo the motivation that drives many organisations results and, and helps them with focus, whether it's, you know, looking at the investors and income or whether it's beneficiaries in a different sector, that can actually be a barrier to flexibility and learning. And that's because people have a real short term, can have a very short term view. Uh, and learning's often not longer term while there's constraints at the sort of immediate returns, whether they're financial returns, whether it's frontline delivery, whether you're in the NHS and there's numbers of patients and targets to meet. And that can create a culture of pragmatism and shortcuts. Uh, and the problem there is there's not enough space or even a requirement in an organisation to step back and learn. Uh, so and it's well recognised that that the world is much more complex now. Uh, leaders need to learn from lots and lots of different inputs, whether that's about globalization or change in society or what's acceptable in, in society. And a thriving organization needs to be really flexible and, and respond to customers, to the market, to beneficiary demands, and take in all those multiple inputs and and leaders in that world, whatever sector, need to be able to stop and maybe even amend or, or readjust their goals. Uh, and this is really well described by uh, Spencer Stewart in an article that, called The Rise of the Learning Culture, which I really recommend a really clear, simple kind of article, really vivid. And he uses a helicopter analogy, which I really like. And he talks about just as a pilot needs to be continually aware of all the instruments which inform him and adapt him in adapt, you know, adapt the journey in real time, although he knows ultimately where he's going. So a good leader or a great leader needs to be aware of the whole context, all these different inputs, stakeholders, the employees, the way the business is being done and managed and maybe amend. Um, and Mintzberg, a really famous leadership writer, describes this really, really beautifully as a sort of philosophical shift, if you like, or a philosophical move from, from doing more to doing better. And he's got a lovely phrase, which I've taken from the article. He describes it as a shift from thinking about managing human resources to bringing, bringing about human resourcefulness. So how can we enable our people? How can we increase their capability and their capacity to learn continuously? And that's the kind of key to what a learning culture is. Uh, now we could spend, we won't spend all day talking about a learning culture. Oh, that, and there's the reference, the rise of a learning culture by Spencer Stewart. And this is kind of massively condensed from his article. So just some kind of, uh, really simple images to give you a sense of what a learning culture is. Um, it very much needs to be driven for the top and the need for change in a learning culture needs to be continually articulated. So for example, in a, in a large or complex organization where there's lots of different functions, you know, whether, they're, whether they're fundraising and research or whether they're marketing and sales and manufacturing, those the barriers between those need to be removed and the organization needs to be really properly aligned and leadership in that sort of situation needs to articulate articulate where there's sort of shared elements in the culture so different functions or different silos as they get called in organizations will have sort of sub naturally have subcultures but they need to be pulled together in the service of the whole of the organization. And one way to talk about that or look at that, um, Spencer Stewart is saying, is to consider, almost consider a learning culture, a business process or, you know, strategic aim for the whole organization and to manage that really proactively and really intentionally. Um, so I've got some kind of cute little graphics here. We talk about what a learning culture feels like, about creativity, about openness, about exploration. And we hear at Action Learning Associates, we hear a lot of stories where people don't feel like that about their organisations. Um, there's any number of advantages.
advantage is to do with organizational performance and responsiveness and learning. Uh, employee engagements are often, engagement programs are often kind of created to build a learning culture. And that's where people feel motivated, take full responsibility for their work, um, are comfortable being really proactive, where, you know, curiosity and inquisitiveness is the, is the sort of watchword rather than a sort of this is mine, I'm not sharing it with you kind of thing that we sometimes hear about. Yeah, and successful leaders, we spoke about them. Um, they emphasise innovation and knowledge and creativity, and they very much do that top down. So those are some of the examples of what a learning culture is. So how does action learning uh, sit in this, if you like? Um, I haven't been able to see how well people know action learning, so forgive me. Um, but action learning is essentially a self-managed process where people drive their own learning. It's structured, a very tightly structured, facilitated process for reflecting on people's experience with a group of peers. And it's always a peer learning process, action learning sets are always a peer learning, whether peers are new managers or graduate, new, newly, you know, people coming off a graduate program, or there's a very, quite a substantial program we finished with a big beauty company uh, this week where they'd identified fast tracked their 20, 25, 30 leaders that they expected to be seeing in on the board in the future, really senior leaders. But then again, they were peers. Um, the work that they did was different than you'd expect uh, as first line managers, but they're always peers. Uh, action learning is not, not discussion or advice, and it's not just telling. Um, and a lovely quote here from Stuart Wallace, who worked with us for some time. I learnt so much from my fellow participants. Joining a set isn't nice to do for a chief exec. It's essential. And Stuart Wallace was with us in an open chief exec set. So we do run sets that are cross sector. And that was that was Stuart's comment on his experience. People may or may not know where um, action learning comes from. It's got a really long uh, history and provenance and was developed by someone called Reg Revens. Uh, Reg was a very modest man, uh, a Quaker. He represented Britain in the long jump. I'm pretty sure it's the long jump in the Olympics. And he was also a physicist by trade, by, well, by trade, by profession. And he was part of the laboratory that won the prize for splitting the atom. Now, if we were working face to face, I'd say to people, who knows about Quakers and what do you know about, um, you know, Quaker beliefs and so on, and how might you imagine this scenario acting out? Uh, and, and what people say quite rightly is that Quakers are pacifists, peace loving, but because they're sort of modest people, they don't make a huge fuss about it. So when, when Reg Revens saw how the atom, the splitting the atom was first going to be applied, which was in, during the Second World War, instead of demonstrating or writing to the Times or, or any of those things, he just stepped away from that work and resigned. So sort of very modest Quaker thing to do. And as a man of real renown, Fame is a very different thing now in our time, very different thing. It's much more fleeting. But as a man of real renown in his, in his, you know, in his middle years, he was offered all sorts of jobs and he took a job as the head of the coal board. You know, an, an old industry, an old fashioned in, industry now in, um, in Britain. And piloted and practiced the action learning practice that I'll, I'll show you briefly uh, using the worst performing pits in two parts of the country. So he set up a, I guess, a learning pilot, a learning experiment. And being a scientist, he, he was very good with data, uh, something I know myself and some learning and development uh, professionals, we sometimes struggle with kind of hard data, but he was very good at hard, with hard data. And he sought the worst performing pits in two parts of the country using all sorts of data from the industry. Um, and I'm not a manufacturer, but I imagine it was things like, you know, the amount of time the machine was out or how long it took to replace a part. Um, you know, 
what's the certain tonnage of coal that came out of certain seams, all that kind of really hard, um, easily available manufacturing data, as well as the things like um, absenteeism and sickness and attendance and so on and so forth. He took the worst performing pits in two areas, put them through the action learning process that we'll, we'll just get a glimpse of. And at the end of the year, those very, those the worst performing pits on that hard data had, uh, had exceeded the rest of the industry. So that was a really kind of strong and amazing start for action learning. And it's been used consistently since in the, in the public sector, private sector, overseas, face-to-face -face and virtually. Um, and so why does it work and where does the learning come from and how does that sit with, uh, with a learning culture? So what Reg says, um, is that he put together a kind of an equation, albeit um, I guess it wouldn't stand up in terms of being interrogated by a physicist, but he talks about real learning for adults coming from programmed knowledge and program knowledge is, you know, all our professional training, all our professional experience, you know, our experience at work, our experience with colleagues, all of that with questioning insight. And questioning insight is the place where we stop and slow down and reflect. Um, and the world of work is making that increasingly hard. Um, and certainly since Reg's time, the world of work's become even tougher. And a quote from, from Reg Revens, action learning is based on the idea that people have an unlimited capacity to learn from experience. So classroom teaching. An unlimited, ex an unlimited capacity to learn from experience as, as opposed to a limited capacity. Sorry, I said that wrong a limited capacity to learn from being taught in a classroom. Um, and that's quite, that's quite interesting. And I think a lot of us would, you know, informally kind of endorse that. It does, you know, to endlessly being taught doesn't work. Um, I'm going to really briefly show you a learning theory or two to explain why it works. And then I've seen there's some great questions and what we'll do is get straight to the questions. So one of the reasons that we, we know we understand that action learning works, is it creates what we call double loop learning. Uh, normal life, normal learning, more, normal learning and development work is often single loop learning. I, you know, I've got a difficulty, um, I don't know, for instance, I'm, I need to start learning to manage database, databases or people who do data entry and I don't know anything about their jobs. So then I get some strategies and techniques and I get some results. And that's a kind of common problem solving learning style. It's really important. And for any of us who've ever line managed or do line manage, if we've got people who don't learn at work, don't do single loop learning, don't problem solve, you know, they'll be flagged up as an issue for us. So it really matters. But double loop learning goes one beyond that. Double loop learning interrogates why is this an issue? and helps us look at the assumptions behind certain challenges. Um, and I can give a personal example here. Um, when I was last in, employed by a company, I was, I've always enjoyed new work. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a real joy in this kind of work to go into different organisations. But I was finding the start of projects really, really stressful. Um, for some reason, I couldn't put my finger on. And my approach being a kind of you know, organizational learning consultant was to look for more tools and techniques and project management tools and project definition tools and project spec tools and so on to better define the start of the work. So I was looking at my problem, looking for strategies, techniques and hoping for results. And despite all my looking for those things and, and using them and getting trained in that part of project management, um, I wasn't feeling any better about the start of work the start of work projects. And it was only going to an action learning set and sort of putting this problem out there. You know, how is it I used to feel really comfortable at, at new work and now somehow I'm feeling really uncomfortable. And it was only by being challenged with lots of open questions that actually I realized that the issue wasn't so much my skill level 
or, or technical skill level about starting pieces of work. It was the fact that my manager at the time had so much confidence in me, he was letting me start new pieces of work or, or meet new customers without briefing me accurately. And I was repeatedly going into situations where people, customers effectively thought I knew more than I did and feeling a bit, well, silly, stupid, whatever, <laughs> you know, a bit exposed. And it was only in unpicking that actually my issue was in standing up, to, identifying that and standing up to my manager uh, that I sorted that issue out. And we had some robust conversations and, and two things happened. Uh, it changed, it changed how he managed me. I never, in, the, in that situation, in that role, in that, in that company, I never started new work feeling uncomfortable again. Uh, and I had the courage and confidence to say, I'm really happy to pick this piece up when you guarantee me you have briefed me properly. Um, and that stayed with me now. I now really enjoy getting new work and shaping new work and the beginnings of new work. You know, I'm, I'm not one of life's completest finishers, but I really enjoy the start. So that's a, an example of double loop learning where I'd, I thought I had a problem. I had a difficulty or, or an issue. I was frantically working at results that weren't getting me what I needed. And it was only interrogating sort of assumptions and beliefs behind it that I got a much fuller double loop learning that is really, really sustainable. And that's one of the things that action learning does. Um, it really helps with the questioning with double loop learning. So I'll probably just fly through this next slide. It just describes how mem set members learn from experience, bringing an issue, getting new perspectives, exploring options, deciding on action and taking progress at the next meeting. Um, and this work has a real impact on organizational performance, um, action learning. So in, yeah, in action learning, we find a bit like in my, the personal example I gave, people have a very high degree of ownership of action. They identify themselves in an action learning set. And it's a really proven means to change behavior in organizations. So it's, it's it is easy, well, comparatively easy for people to go on a training event or a learning and development event, have a lot of insights, have a really good experience, really feel, you know, feel they understand themselves, how they work better. But to take that back into the workplace on the Monday morning and Tuesday and Wednesday and the following Monday and actually do something different consistently is really hard. It's, it's a bit of a holy grail for learning and development. And action learning really works here. Um, and we say it operates in a sort of in the spot or the place where reflective learning really impacts organizational change. And in that way, it really contributes to a learning organization. If you get enough people doing this work, they'll be challenging, you know, processes, procedures, managers themselves, project definitions, whatever, uh, and, and looking at them differently and learning much more profoundly. So action learning can have a real demonstrable impact on resilience in organizations, on organizational performance, and most importantly now, given we're sort of talking about a, a learning organization and a learning culture, the whole culture of, of an organization just being a learning culture, action learning works for sustainability of learning. People, you know, go to action learning sets and do different things as a result and remember that they've done them, you know, hold on to it, talk about it and make it, you know, really make it make a difference. And I've got lots of examples, but I am wondering if I shouldn't perhaps look at your questions or, um, yeah, well, maybe I'll, I'll do, do a couple of examples quickly because I'm conscious I'm just talking about my, from my presentation and I very much want to get to people's questions. So, couple of really simple examples, well, simple examples, <laughs> hope clear examples, where action learning has contributed to a learning culture. Uh, we, a while ago, did a huge program with Heineken, the, um, the lager company, global, global lager um, and drinks company. Um, 
we trained, ooh, I can't remember now, but between 200 and 300 people to facilitate action learning sets. And they took that work away. And as part of the first line development manager program, the 250 people we trained then ran action learning sets around the world. We carried on in facilitator sets virtually. Um, people became accredited with us, but we heard amazing feedback about the difference it made for the boat for two things, for the managers who were running the action learning sets and for the culture in all these, you know, brewing factories, research sites, finance departments. So it was, you know, we went way beyond your original, your usual kind of um, learning and development people or HR people. Uh, and we heard stories, uh, lovely stories, I say stories, but you know, true stories of people where enough people had been trained in their headquarters, they could send an email out and say, you know, I've got this issue or this project I'm stuck with. Can we get together and have an action learning set for a couple of hours, an hour and a half at lunchtime or at four o'clock tonight and help me with something? So we had real, you know, really great anecdotal evidence as well as the kind of scored evaluation material. Um, about action learning, making a real contribution to, to a shift in a, in a learning culture in a company. Uh, and it, there, there were cultural changes in that, cultural, not changes, cultural barriers in, in a company like Heineken, because in anything in retail, uh, it's a very fast pressured environment and to stop and pause and really reflect is kind of counterculture. Mm -hmm. So we really felt that action learning sort of you know, made a strong, strong impact there, given people, you know, were inclined to say, well, I don't know, this batch of beer is not quite right. Let's change it now to do, do X instead of do Y without necessarily interrogating in detail how it might have gone wrong. Um, so that's one kind of example. A closer to home example, um, we worked recently with a local authority, a large local authority in the southeast that was having um, had some challenges or some concerns about their safeguarding practice. This is for social work, social work managers and it was adult safeguarding work. And again, we trained maybe 50, 45, 50 senior social workers who went on to run action learning sets with a focus and a theme of improving safeguarding practice in adults. And at the same time as these people ran sets, they stayed in meta sets with us. And we monitored the impact, both in terms of individual stories and in terms of the overall shift in terms of behaviours against a competency framework. Uh, we mo monitored shifts and changes in behaviour and people's ability to challenge more, whether they were challenging their managers or their senior managers, whether they were more robust in stakeholding, stakeholder situations or with you know, NHS partners or whatever. Uh, so a lot of really in-depth work that really, really supported um, improving service delivery and contributed to a, to a learning culture in that organisation. So let's see, I think I've got some questions coming up that people have already offered. Uh, so let's see, um, and also let's see what people have asked me today. If I go back, let's have a look. Sounds and visuals okay. Here's some learning examples of learning culture you asked, Julie. I hope I've given you, obviously this is just a taster. I mean, you know, it's a 40 minute webinar really. Um, okay, this is a really good example here from Owen. Um, how does sharing within the action learning cell set manifest itself in the wider organization? Um, and it sounds like Owen knows action learning quite well. Uh, largely, action learning sets content is confidential. Right? It's one of the things that works to create trust in an action learning set. So in the situations like um, the safeguarding example I just gave, we created kind of very clear and transparent, I say mechanisms, but just mechanisms and processes about what would and what could and couldn't be agreed. So in those sets where we identified that um, social workers might have certain actions they would take, but some of them actually had a wider organizational implication. 
um, and the facilitators on our side, there were three of us that were running those sets. With the set's permission, we collected the actions anonymously, but we collected the actions and quite quickly identified there were certain themes where this particular local authority could do more to support its safeguarding practice in a number of ways. And we had really regular monthly feedback meetings with the commission, a commissioning team and a project team. Uh, and again, we fed that back to the action learning set. So everything was anonymized, but where there were key themes and a theme that comes to mind, and I've got permission to speak about, there were situations where social workers were going into situations that were not safe. That as a result of you know pressure on time and resources against uh, against recommended practices within that local authority, social workers were making individual visits to people who'd already been identified, perhaps with a mental health issue, where it was already identified one social worker should not be visiting. And enough of those came to light that that whole practice was reviewed by the whole local authority. Um, so I hope that that's kind of a glimpse of one example, Owen, of how how you can get the learning from action learning sets with with proper pre, you know, pre contracting um, and real, ex, you know, really explicit. Um, so what else have we got here? I hope that I'm beginning to give you a glimpse there, Susan, about the links to a learning organisation. <gasps> University environment. Okay, how do you approach getting buy-in for this in the university environment? Um, apart from having several times been a university student, uh, I, I understand that the cultures in universities are quite different. They're not all the same, although there's huge pressure at the moment. I know it can be difficult with ex to help experts learn. Um, so this sounds to me like you know, what's the best point of entry? Where have you got leverage is the kind of thing that comes to me for, for this question, Caroline. You know, where's the point of pressure? What's really happening in, a, in an organization that makes a difference? Uh, yeah, where, where, would that, where would that go? And, and how does that link to what's happening in terms of, you know, university funding? Uh, so those are the kinds of things I'd say there. That's at quite a high level, I realize. Um, now, have I missed any questions or shall I look at the ones that were previously presented? Ah, are we some, oh, that's Owens, some examples. Okay. What action learning is, we've only done, I've only done the briefest sort of introduction there, Kelly, but I'm happy where I haven't answered your questions or haven't answered them fully to have follow up conversations with anyone. Um, now I've got a couple of questions, that, three questions that were pre that, that people offered us when we sent out the webinar invitation. And if others come to mind, um, or Caroline, if you wanted to be more specific about your university challenge, I might be able to answer more fully there. And if others come to mind, I'll, I'll take these, I'll, I'll, I'll um, take them. So somebody, and I'm sorry, I don't know if it's anyone present. Uh, someone asked me if you were starting from the beginning, uh, with an employee engagement program. And this was in terms of creating a, a culture change. What would you do? And partly it would depend on where the organization is. So what's the drive behind the employee engagement program? What's gone, what's gone wrong? Or what's made the organization identify that now it matters? You know? And it may be around a learning culture. It may be around performance. Um, we had an example with a large housing association created a large employee engagement program uh, because they were getting really poor, poor, poor results from their employee survey. We did an annual employee survey. And our suggestions there were to be really honest. You know, we understand on these seven or eight or 10 dimension, dimensions, um, the organization is not, you know, not meeting people's needs. And as a result, one of the things we're gonna do, they called them, um, Managers change and challenge sets a rather a bit of a mouthful to be honest uh, But that organization felt that that sounded better than action learning sets and reflected what was going on in the organization So they created managers change and challenge sets uh, Which were opportunities for managers to select in to you know to attend to help them 
learn from others and respond to all the cultural changes in an organization. And that was intentionally set up as an employee engagement program. So I guess as a short headline to that question, I'd start with whatever it is that made, made the organization notice that was an issue. That would be my place to start. Um, I've got another question here, I think from Owen again. Thank you for your interest here, Owen. How long do you need? How long do you need for an action learning set ideally? The Heineken impromptu meeting sounded very interesting as well as very short. That's a really good point. And forgive me, I realize now I've answered questions that I didn't read and I'm not entirely sure who can, who can see them. So the first question I answered, uh, it's a bit late now, but the first question I answered was how does the sharing within the action learning set manifest itself within the organization? And how can we see it or evidence it for those who contract with action learning sets? And that in response to that, I was talking about the local authority safeguarding example. Um, and now I've got, how long do you need for an action learning set ideally? Um, the Heineken impromptu meeting sounded interesting. So when we're running action learning sets from the beginning, we try and do, we usually have a series of six and we try and do a full day up front and then six, then five or six half days spread at roughly six to eight week intervals. Um, in the in the Heineken sort of impromptu example, and impromptu is exactly the right word. Uh, thank you for listening so well there. Um, you, if everybody is really up and running, you could actually do it in 45 minutes, but you need people in the room sitting down and not having coffee chatting or, or putting the world to rights. You know, people need to get going. So I'd, and, and actually what Heineken were doing was doing it over their lunchtime primarily. Um, I don't know how long they had for lunchtime, but it sounded, this was, the, um, this was their head office based in Amsterdam that you may well have seen actually, if any of you have visited Amsterdam. So I think they're quite good with a work-life balance. Uh, so I imagine they had an hour for lunch and, and that's how they did it. Um, but they did have people coming to these meetings who knew what action learning was, who had trained, who who'd run sets so they could kind of hit the ground running, if that makes sense. Oh, and I understand you can see the question. Thank you for that. Um, so yes, you can do it in an hour. Um, but it's hard to do it in an hour if people don't know what they're doing. That won't work. They sort of need, they definitely need to know what they're doing to start with. So I have another question here that someone offered me earlier um, when they signed up. Isn't action learning massively time consuming? How do you make it sustainable? And actually, that's a really, uh, that is a really good question. And uh, in a sense, it is a kind of comparatively labor intensive intervention in that you'll have one facilitator and say eight people for an afternoon. Uh, and that's more than lots of learning and development interventions, uh, much more, you know, way more than a townhouse type intervention. Uh, but our approach here to make it sustainable, and that certainly chimes with what I was saying about the local authority safeguarding and with Heineken, is actually to train people in-house in a really rigorous standard of facilitating action learning sets. And then what you've got, it might be the L&D team, or it might be lots of master brewers, which is what we had in Heineken, or senior social workers, you know, going beyond your L&D team. But then what you've got is a team of people in-house who can run action learning sets again and again and again. And that's one of the ways that, that helps make it really sustainable because building on that experience people can tweak it for their their situations their conditions their markets um, so so that's what we talk about sustainability um, well, okay question here from julie thank you what steps could i take to increase the priority to learning in my organization how can I influence the culture in a more impact? OK, two questions <laughs> um, in classic action mode uh, style. I'll try and do one at a time. Um, so what steps could I take to increase the priority given to learning in my organization? Um, to an extent, I one way and, and I think learning and development professionals and I know in the past I've been guilty of this 
can sort of talk about learning as a soft, you know, as a soft skill um, and talk about it in kind of rather loose ways. And I think the tighter you can link it to the business or the organizational objectives or priorities, the better. Um, so people in business, organizations or business, and I'm, I'm using business now in a sort of loose sense, um, care about the purpose of their organization, you know, whether that's rehousing refugees or, you know, delivering, you know, frontline care in a community health setting or selling more beer or more cosmetics or whatever. They care about the business. That's what they're being um, rewarded for and prioritized on. And that's how they're spending their day and they're not, you know, hopefully not their night, but that's what's keeping them awake. So the way I'd increase the sort of priority given to learning is what are the things that are not working? What are the pinch points? Where, where are the same mistakes being ha are happening again and again? You know, what's happening in the organization that if we learnt from, we would be improving our performance? So I'd look at learning as, you know, as a performance, performance improvement type tool. Oh, excuse me, I'm just going to have some water. I'd look at it around resilience as well. What's happening in the organization around, I don't know, it might be retention, retention um, at certain grades or in certain positions. It might be um, attendance. I go right back to the coal mining example. Um, in the first action learning situation, Reg Revens was finding or finding from his coal, mi coal, man coal mining managers that getting people to work on a Monday morning was a big deal. So what's going wrong in an organisation that a learning culture could help with and join those dots? That's the place where I would start. Um, so Lisa. Uh, OK, similar to Julie's question. Small team and strategy objectives driven. Any time, any tips to reflect and take time out to prioritize learning and development? Small and busy charity team. Okay. Well, if you, you talk, I think you said tips there, didn't you? Just say tips, right? Well, a really simple tip is just to start a genuine learning review at the end of every, um, I don't know, team meeting once a quarter or every event. If, for instance, if you're a fundraising department, so put in on your team agendas for half an hour, you know, once a month or whatever's the, the, the relevant appropriate kind of pause. What made that event go really well? You know, and brainstorm it and everyone's allowed to say everything they wanted. What would have made it go better? You know, it would have been even better if. And that second question then naturally takes us to a, OK, so what would we do next time? You know, if we raised a huge amount of money for our small charity uh, what you know on this last event and these things would make it better what events are coming up and what would we do differently or what what might that mean for people we're recruiting to our fundraising department for instance so that would be the smallest um tip i can say uh to, to have learning and reflection you know at least be on your kind of work agenda if that makes sense have it be integrated um, so I hope that that sort of makes it a bit clearer. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to quickly say something. I haven't got a new question. OK, quickly say something for the last question. And then I think the last slide just says gives you my details. If anybody wants to follow up where I've woefully not responded fully to questions or we've just you know glimpsed or touched on something and you'd like to understand it better. So the last question I was offered was, um, what do you do when your point of entry in an organization is not at the senior level? Oh, and that, yes, this is a really, really difficult issue here. Um, and it's probably horribly, it was one person that brought this forward, but it's probably horribly familiar to others. And yet this is where you really need to make change. So it's possible as we did in the safeguarding example to create learning loops, if you like, from action learning sets back up to senior managers, which I mean, in that in that example, we were able to say, look, you know, you've got these procedures for keeping your social workers safe. 
but the prevail, you know, prevailing values and cultures are such that they're being told and pressurized in the moment to ignore them. Um, and you can make that information available so you can feedback, reflect back information that is likely to drive change. Um, that would be one, one instant, one, one mechanism, if you like, to find a point of entry at more senior level. Uh, what's going on in the business? That senior level could impact and they'll understand, you know, they'll join the dots between that and business performance or organization performance or safeguarding, if safeguarding is what the issue is. That'd be my kind of really quick response to that. So forgive me, it's a big question and a small, um, small answer or a short answer. This is just a really short graphic about how action learning works and I'm conscious we're at time. So I, I want to really thank everyone for joining me. Uh, it's a big deal to carve 45 minutes out of the day. I know it kind of interrupts your day, so I hope, I hope it's been helpful. I'd be very happy to hear from, from anyone. And uh, you know, if, you, if you'd like to understand more about a learning culture or how action learning can help your organization, feel free to call or to email and, um, and we can arrange a conversation. Um, doesn't, okay, so people are saying thank you. It's really kind. Thank you everyone for, um, for joining. It would be very strange if I were talk, doing this knowing that there was nobody here. So I appreciated the questions and the, uh, you know, the questions and the stimulation and the contact. And I'm sorry that, I'm sorry it's so short, but that's how, that's what this mechanism is. So thank you all. Thank you and goodbye. I'm going to end the meeting, but thank you.